that matters or that's that's been relevant over the last few days in terms of news, in terms of things that drive the news agenda. Um, one thing I've written about myself, for instance, are, are weapons exports and and the question: Do you do you trust weapons companies with granting themselves export licenses? And really, you don't, right? So um, there's a lot of compliance there, but then there are murkier cases such as regulating Facebook and um, and, and and social media companies. Uh, I, I mean, I, I took a look at how the trust has evolved among consumers um, for those companies, and it's it's gone through a massive fall over the last few years. Um, between 2017 and 2018, uh, trust has declined by 11% in the US alone. So that's quite a significant um, drop that, that's obviously posed a lot of questions on um, how, to, how to respond to that and whether it's perhaps even too late. And, and I think those are the questions we're, we're here to discuss. Um, what's the problem about trusting companies? How can we increase that trust? Um, what could be the positive, perhaps also negative, um, impact of, of increasing trust? And, and what, you know, what initiatives or what schemes already exist to, to do that or have been proposed by some people here on the panel as well. So if we could just um, get you know, a short introduction by each uh, of you, just say your name and, and what your personal connection to this topic is, would be great. Hi, so uh, my name is Anish and I am an assistant professor here at Nova University in Lisbon and also uh, I run a startup called Fashionize.com which is not really a, a, a company in, in that sense because it was built uh, out of uh, what my, my work in terms of my in the, speed, in the area of education. So. Uh, but my work mostly has been on working with entrepreneurships and startups and uh, one of the aspects that, that I was exploring was about how to bring more trust and how to bring the, the soft skills within startups so that a trust-based uh, positive environment can prosper in it. So this has been the topic of much of my research and as well as my work in the startup. And I'm Pernilla Trenberg and I work, <clears throat> I'm a former journalist, but the past seven, eight years I've been working with um, privacy and data ethics. So I'm teaching uh, individuals, especially teens, in how to take control of their own data. And I'm uh, talking to and also advising companies and organizations in how to use data in an ethical way. And since we're not that many people, everyone can get one of these when you leave where we actually have written down our principles for data ethics, which is above compliance with GDPR. Um, so that's it for me. I'm, I run a non-profit called dataethics.eu. Okay, okay. Uh, my, my name is Lisa. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm, I've been always in investment banking, so I know exactly what it is. Compliance, does that mean? I recently, like six years ago, I changed for humanitarian causes and for this um, uh, gap that I recently, um, you know, for me didn't, didn't make any sense, you know, the gap that we have between genders. And that far, I created uh, GPL, which is uh, the um, the social compliance agency for human rights, and that's why I'm here because I believe that. Uh, no longer the law, it's enforcement for everything. So without trust, we need to go for the compliance itself. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Galen Crescioni. I am a lawyer uh, from New York. Uh, so I have a, a, a different perspective. Uh, in, our, in my business, it basically entirely runs on people not trusting each other, um, either <laughs> cleaning up someone's mess because uh, you know, businesses uh, couldn't trust each other or predicting um, a breach of trust from the beginning. So it's, we had to sort of set up a, a, a mechanism of, of not being able to trust somebody from the beginning, which um, unfortunately is necessary. Um, I am interested in the idea of how we can um, build trust between people and businesses, but um, in, in my business it's tough because um, there's always going to be somebody who's uh, Breaching trust and going forward, we you know predict the future based on past actions. So um, it's it's difficult for me to see in, in my world how 
you know, how we can build more trust. Yeah. Um, Andrew Chikoen, uh, I'm the founder of Strategic Narrative Consulting uh, company in Amsterdam, uh, Netherlands. Um, my background, I, I served in government, uh, worked in uh, international affairs, and, and now consult uh, tech businesses, not specifically on trust, but uh, on public policy. How do we, how does the company connect with uh, common good? How does the company uh, contribute to a you know, social agenda, not as an afterthought, but as a, as a core business? Uh, and so I have a very macro view on this question, uh, and then maybe we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, good morning, my name is Sonia Abramson. Uh, my background is 25 years in the art world. Uh, I'm on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, if the lawyer uh, worries about no trust, uh, my industry is, I think, I had to look this up, it sounds quite sexy, we're the most second largest unregulated market after narcotics. Our uh, industry is uh, basically uh, based mostly on uh, trust and a handshake and a leap of faith. Uh, our industry is, uh, there are three areas of course where uh, compliance applies, which is anti-money laundering, tax evasion, and uh, preventing tra uh, trading in stolen uh, works of art and protected <coughs> art. But other than that, it is something that it, it remains truly uh, other than the um, search for profit and value, it is a passion project and based on relationship. And so I guess my area where I could contribute on the conversation of trust is what kind of trust does the art market cultivate? And it is one that is based on relationships. And uh, there, I guess, uh, I perhaps can echo and get into a conversation with the lawyer and other ones, but that's my, more my area. Thanks so much. Well, feel free to <coughs> jump in at any point. We're not that many people, so uh, um, that will be fine. But as you've seen, we have a broad range of um, very broad spectrum here on, on stage. And uh, so I think it will be a very interesting discussion. Maybe let's start with the perhaps more pessimistic take. <laughs> um, what are sort of the challenges um, th that prevent trust from being built? Uh, the problem I see is, uh, in what I deal with, there's always a certain number, I would say percentage even, of, of individuals and businesses who are not going to be trustworthy. And in fact, I have dealt with several um, businesses where it's built into their business model to basically, uh, if they're in a contract and they just don't pay on the contract, they get sued, they go through litigation, because they've already uh, looked at the cost of that versus the cost of paying the contract in, in the beginning, and um, they save money. And at the end of the day, uh, over a long period of time, eventually no one's going to do business with them anymore, but um, this is sort of their, I guess, short-term thinking. Um, so uh, if a client comes to me and says, you know, uh, they want to get into business with somebody, uh, and we want to make it really secure, just, you know, even if they say, they, they trust who they're working with, you just can never be sure because on the other end of it, when we have to go to litigation, uh, clients always say, I can't believe this happened, I trusted them, you know, I don't know what happened. So how, how can you look at who is trustworthy and who is not, except if you have had a long uh, relationship? But even, even in, in that, um, to, to what you're saying, building trust on the relationship, uh, I, I've had clients who have been in business with people for you know, 20 years, and then they reach trust. And a lot of times, there's misunderstandings or miscommunications, and sometimes lawyers get blamed for it. But I, I think one of the uh, points here, and to bring in the opinion up, is that uh, as, I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, trust is also um, in my area is all I have, and after being 25 years in this business, is I have my name and a handshake. And that doesn't go away. And what does trust underpins is a common and a shared value of common ethics, and it's about caring about your reputation. 
and its reputation management. So I think that before we talk about compliance, one also has to understand that the area probably is wider. Uh, and you cannot talk about trust if you don't have a shared value system. Well, uh, can I just sure. go and stop um, I, well, I hope, uh, I wish that it would be a wonderful world if we could use just our name and handshake, you know. That would be fantastic, but unfortunately it's not, you know, we know that. Um, you know, most of the companies, you know, um, you probably work for a company as well or something, you know. And one thing is that when we actually bring to forward what we are and what we stand for, and sometimes, you know, our name or our shared hand can go along <coughs> with a company or with something that goes wrong and, you know, really takes you off on that, on that track. On a way that, um, that's why nowadays everything, it's not just for data, which I believe that it's very, very needed, actually. And um, so that's why agencies that really, regulators, for me the most important word is regulators. We actually need to have, we have the rating houses, we have everything actually supposed to work. It doesn't work at all. We know that. So um, we really need to have a more uh, narrow, you know, more specific compliance on today's life, especially on business life. Sorry for interrupting, but wouldn't the counter argument be that, um, that a lot of the innovations that take place happen so fast these days that that regulators actually can't catch up? Um, oftentimes, they, they're just not speedy or quick enough. So, um, so that's where self-regulation and trust does come in. Right? <coughs> you don't need to have a certain amount of trust uh, in tech companies to to create rules to you know, um, understand the ethical implications of what they're doing. Ethical implications regulators might not even understand by that point. Yes, exactly. Uh, so right now we are under blockchain, you know, basically most of the companies that we're looking for. And I believe that, um, you know, transparency is actually a very needed word, not just in business, but in between people as well. So uh, I think there's no uh, way to go uh, right now. But um, yes, I do agree with you. you know, transparency really needs to go forward. Is there, um, and if, does anyone here have, have any sort of opinion on, on how that's been changing over the last few years? To, to what extent um, has consumer awareness that is growing uh, quite, quite rapidly through um, review websites or through the internet really also, um, has that driven a change in, in the way companies um, see themselves and see ethical decisions maybe? Uh, I also believe in regulation, definitely. That's the basics. We need that and we need enforcement because companies won't uh, do anything on their own, generally. But what I see and uh, I've seen in the past five years uh, is a move towards thinking uh, more about the customers and the end users because most are now waking up to what has actually been happening the past 10 years without personal data. And personal data, how much it's worth, how powerful it is, how much money you can make on it. So we're seeing now companies listening, I think, more to their customers than to the laws. <clears throat> but of course, they're always good and bad. And that's what I'm doing. I'm constantly showing the good ones. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there are lots of bad ones, like Google, Facebook, Amazon, and a lot of Chinese companies. But there are lots of good ones as well. And I just want to give you one example, and I can give you many more. One is Lego. The, the worldwide uh, Lego company producing uh, toys for children, they don't brag about it, they just do it because it's a, it's a conscious company who is always working like that. For example, they have no third-party cookies on their website. It could be totally legal according to GDPR if you do it in the right way, but they don't want to share data about their users with anyone else. Of course it's easy because it's children. They don't have Google Analytics on the website either, but why should they share all their data with Google? They don't, they have, um, they forbid manip manipulative um, uh, behavioral ta targeting. So they say, well, we don't want to uh, nudge children into buying more and more and more and more, which is the big game, I think, coming, especially from the US. So they're very aware of all these things. 
uh, and they just do it, and they don't brag about it. And that's that's. I think it's going to live in the long run. And why do they do it, and other companies? Do it? Well, I, well, you should ask Mattel and Disney and all the competitors. They can do it. They think. Um, I think that they listen too much to, to everybody saying this has to be so fast, we have to get on this train with AI and it's speedy, it's exponential, it can't go fast enough. And that's what China and the US is doing right now. They are just on that train and everybody in Europe says, well, we want to be on that train as well because it's speedy, but I think we should do it in a slower way. And I just heard a really good saying, the second mouse always gets a cheese, not the first one. And that's what we should be thinking on in Europe, about in Europe. We should develop tech, but we should do it in a human pace, in a human-like pace. It, it doesn't have to be that fast. Our data is not that good in, in yet to do all these things that Singularity University and all these people are telling us that do it, it's, otherwise you'll lose out. I'm not afraid of that. Anish, um, broadening the debate a little bit again from, from this um, data aspect, what is it that makes a difference uh, between companies that can be trusted and, and companies that can't? So um, I would say that the main reason why there is a lack of trust or companies uh, feel that trust is not the way that we want to go is simply because of a sense of fear and insecurity or competition because there, there's a, there was a belief that, uh, that the world is a zero-sum game and I think that's what sums it up because when you believe that uh, you know, if I need to win, someone else needs to lose so, uh, so then being completely honest is seen as being stupid and, and I think this is the big shift uh, that has been happening and what is driving, because naturally our human uh, nature by itself is to uh, thrive on a trust-based society where you, uh, you, you actually believe that everyone has the common good in mind. And uh, because, uh, and what is really driving it forward is uh, the fact that we have had transparency in, a w in ways that we have never had before and thanks to a lot uh, in terms of the digital technologies and also the fact that we've been seen things like WikiLeaks and other things come out. So, so actually there have been examples said that where you are hiding something or you're, you're doing business in, a, in ethical ways or even in governance, eventually it will come out and come back to bite you. And, and, and I think this has been the biggest shift because there have been companies, there have been examples uh, where when companies do trust-based business where they, have, they believe that they have the common good in mind, those companies eventually end, to end up having greater goodwill and also thanks to the, uh, the social media today, uh, companies that earn that reputation that uh, they can le really leverage on that to, uh, to make business sense. So I think it's, it's a mixture of all of this and we're seeing this big trend towards, uh, uh, towards a society where trust uh, is becoming the foundation of, uh, of building a solid business. So just that question, sure, absolutely. I think it uh, brings up for me an, an idea. I think uh, it's like in the, with uh, crime, a similar situation. So when you're living in Europe, you feel very comfortable. You don't worry about it. But when you live in a, a country like Mexico, uh, you, you just live with the crime. So you arrange yourself. And I think what, uh, what I'm, I'm feeling now is most people don't trust anymore, but they start living with it. So they, they just decide, okay, is this critical that I give this data? Now, can, could someone do something with it? Or are they just using that for their business? So I think the, the, the relationship to the companies is changing. They don't, there is no basic trust anymore, mm -hmm. but people arrange them. That's a really interesting point. Um, yeah. So what, what do you guys think of, are we, for, for social media, are we beyond the point of trust? Hey. I think this is actually an excellent point to, to look at the very root of what we're discussing. Uh, it's a, a conference about <coughs> benefits of globalization and, and you started with the point that trust is deteriorating. And, and as I said, my background is in global affairs and I, and I feel that there's one um, ununderstood point that uh, the automation of everything and the globalization of everything, what it has created is globalized world of commerce, globalized world of media, you know, our digital reality is globalized with no borders. Right? For a um, company like Apple or Facebook or Google, there are no borders. 
And then we talked about regulation. Who gets to regulate anything globally? Beyond UN, we have no institutions. So we simply have the counterbalance has disappeared, and that's what has taken the trust away. Because we're not only talking about tech, we're talking about anything that is global in nature has no counterbalance. Uh, and, and, you know, an analogy for me is, is 90 years back, uh, the year 1929, so what happened? You know, the, the whole thing collapsed. You had the 20s was a big party. Uh, business was booming, everybody was making money, everybody was living a happy life. Government stood back, watched uh, you know, how, how private sector is driving uh, things forward and how we're producing anything and everything, except that it all collapsed. And then we had the Great Depression. So the way I would characterize what we have now is, is a great uh, you know, uh, backlash against globalization, against automation, against progress of any kind. And, and it's not the same exact thing as depression. I wouldn't you know, throw a direct analogy. But it is happening, and it's taking this trust away. And until we are in a situation where uh, all the globalized system have a globalized control of some sort that is you know, with the citizens, uh, we, will, we will be spinning downwards. That's, uh, that's my macro perspective at this. I, sure. I, just, I just have a, a point of view regarding your question, which is <clears throat> when I created the GPL Generator Label, basically it's um, an agency that uh, acts on companies and countries and regulates them on 10 principles, basically. So you have human rights and you have climate change. The companies and the country itself, they do need to have those 10 principles, otherwise you will not have the label. Okay, the label, it's like the regulator for all, everything that the company is doing. Okay, you mentioned legal. Okay, I can mention lots of companies over here that I was really, really, you know, sad because I actually like the companies itself. And when I just, you know, start to evaluate the companies, I just, you know, I didn't cry because I'm a <laughs> but um, I'm a human like person. And I felt, okay guys, we really need to talk. I want to see you with this stamp, with this label. That means that when people will see the logo, they will feel free to actually, and especially if you are um, a listed company, okay? Your investor will look at that and say, okay, let's focus on real, sustainable, you know, let's make this company grow actually, because the rest is already here. We know what does that mean. So, we're talking about regulators and global. Yeah, that's it. More global we will, more regulators we need. Because, you know, I do believe that um, without regulation, it's going to be very, very, very hard to another step forward. So how have those companies responded to your label? Especially once you didn't break well, You know, they were very happy. Not just companies, countries itself. I'm going to Tunisia on the 23rd. I just, you know, returned from New York. And they are actually looking for someone that has been doing their homework, like the 10 principles from United Nations, you know, from Global Compact, to say, okay guys, we have here human rights and we have here climate change. That's it. If you have those 10 principles, you move forward. You just need to focus on, on a company that should do, which is how are you going to grow? What's the next step to do it? So the companies in the countries, yes, they are acting very, very well with it. Okay. Interesting to hear. What's your perspective? Uh, well, I, I really do believe that trust is uh, almost gone, even in the Nordic countries where we have very, very high trust. And that's when we talk about personal data. And that's because of mainly global tech. Um, but I think it's going to change because now the young generation below 15 have tried this, you know, in Denmark, for example, there's a big court case against a thousand young children, young people who have shared videos of pornography, of themselves, actually. And it's a big case, but it's totally raising awareness. So just with the, like with the climate, I think that the younger generation is going to change this totally. They, they want secrecy. They don't want to be totally transparent and public. But we need to give them the tools and we need to help them understand also um, why we have human rights. A lot of young people, when I ask them about, you know, what is private to you, they don't even think about the privacy. 
But when I talk, ask them, what do you want to keep away from other people, then they understand it. So it's also about talking about it, telling it's there's a reason for why you can have secrets. We need that as humans. So I think the young generation is going to protest, and especially the, the consumers, that's what companies will listen to. So Facebook is totally on the way down, even though you have a very bleak, uh, futuristic view, and then sometimes I'm in the same mood as you are, but let's also be positive. <laughs> Do you have a point on that? Well, I would have uh, uh, differ a little bit uh, from uh, what you because in an ideal world or in a utopic world, I don't think uh, the need for secrecy should be there. Uh, because I think uh, we can deal with the problem through compliance and regulations, but that's only a stopgap arrangement. As long as human beings and uh, human consciousness is not uh, evolved to a state where, uh, where human beings can trust each other, so, so what's the big tool that we have other than compliance and it's transparency. That's the only tool that we have that, uh, that, that can ensure because uh, compliance and regulation is fine but sometimes you know, when innovations happen at very rapid pace, uh, these very regulations can come back to bite you because they, they hinder innovation. Quick correction. I, when I talk secrecy, I talk about individuals. I totally agree on full transparency when it's, it comes to those in power, companies, governments, etc. Okay. Yeah. Nothing that you can do. Just a, a quick comment on my uh, grim view. Uh, I think what I recognize is, is the global system has not keeping up with pace of globalization in a way. But I'm not saying this is indefinite. Actually, I'm very optimistic in the sense that eventually we'll figure this out. You know, if you take any nation state today, or take France, uh, you know, it was uh, city states. City states eventually organized, became a nation state. You have EU that organized itself as, as a block of country. Political integration is not keeping up with the economic integration. That's why you have uh, disunity. But if it was to keep up, then there'll be uh, you know, there'll be a European elected government that will effectively address European, Europe-wide problems. Uh, I, of course, those, none of those things will happen overnight, but the trend is from smaller units to bigger uh, entities, and eventually we will figure this out. I, I just don't know how many years, decades, hopefully years, it'll take when we say, look, if the climate take climate debate, it's, it's being addressed at the global level. Poorly, you know, not not fast enough, but it is happening, right? The only way to deal with climate is if all the countries come together, and then we will learn this. And then same with GDPR, you know, one uh, continent leads, others catch up, but eventually we'll say we need to do it as one planet. If take, uh, I don't know, digital taxation. Uh, the debate is now in individual countries say, why don't we tax whatever digital services are provided? in our jurisdiction. And if we do it in multiple jurisdictions, it's just nonsense. It's not going to really work. Because then it's a race to the bottom. Uh, it's, it's, you know, maybe we're going away from trust a little bit. But uh, the global organization is critical and we will, we will sort it out eventually. Is there a feeling um, that this, this process is also going to lead to more quality, more diversity? Yeah, it's the journey versus the destination. If and when our regulatory frameworks, our global coordination keeps up with everything else, then things will hopefully get back to balance. The journey itself is, is probably going to be very uh, difficult. As the former Prime Minister of Finland put it, he said, you cannot have change without crisis. So what we have now is this crisis almost every which way in terms of backlash against and, and, you know, it's called backlash against globalization and the, the globalist versus populist, but it's not that. It's simply the pace of change. It has to do with automation and everything, the, the pace of technological advancement. And then and the society says, we just can't deal with it. We want to go back to whatever. Uh, and, and then we go, you know, make America great again and, and the rest of those ideas. But we will see that that's not working. Eventually, we'll come around and recognize that, that we're really the problem where we need to globalize more, 
we're addressing by localizing or whatever, going back to uh, to something that's not going to solve the problem. So once we figure that out, once we are in a deeper crisis, then we will come to a solution. If, again, I'm not saying it's great, it just seems to be the way forward. Okay, thanks. So, so we, we've been talking a lot about... Uh, yeah. Well, I just have a kind of follow-up question, uh, or something I've been thinking about when you talk about, about the trust and so on. Uh, because we see that the nation states are coming under pressure in terms of regulation. We see it with like you have Facebook with over two billion users uh, on the globe, so they have like they have their own kind of universal standards and so on. We see it also, of course, with climate. We see it with uh, uh, migration and, and so on. Um, so, so what you're saying is that we shouldn't respond to that by making like national uh, regulations of that. But what is or who is making this kind of uh, global structures and uh, and the idea of a global structure in terms of data, in terms of climate, isn't hasn't that become an illusion? Because we can see that, I mean, just to mention China, Russia, US, Europe, I mean, can't really work together. So at least in my perspective, I work with, with social media and so on. At this point, I only see like either EU doing something or the individual nation states actually doing something if we want action within the next few years. But I would really like to hear this. That's an excellent that. point. If you, there's actually a very recent example. I mean, after the Christchurch attack, um, Australia has this very controversial law um, to, to jail social media executives and fine them if they do not take that down in the, in the future. And they're hoping um, that this is going to be copied by, by other countries. And the UK, for instance, is very interested in doing that. Um, so, so that actually is a, is a very good point, right? Uh, nation states here driving changes that, that are becoming global trends. I couldn't agree more. At present, that's the only mechanism we have. And, and because we need to cope with present, we, we can't, you know, idealistic future where we're all one humanity and there are no borders. When is that coming? Is it coming? <coughs> But uh, you know, leading by example is, is what we have to do now. But long term, the, the system needs to correct itself. Like I said, if we go back to Great Depression, things were going downhill for a long time until government figured out some policies, some strategies, and then and it started going back up because we figured out how to constrain business in a way, how to find you know the, the, like the. This, the, the hashtag from, from Davos, the taxes, 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 that, uh, you know, the redistribution is, is a swear word, but it's what tax system is designed to do, is, is to help uh, redistribute wealth in a way that creates stable society. But we can't talk about it now. Eventually, we will. Uh, it's, yeah, I, it's very theoretical, what I say, and I, and I cannot give you a time horizon, but what's going on today is exactly right. The countries need to lead by example for us to get anywhere at all or else the crisis will be done. Um, I'm not an economist, so obviously I can't engage on uh, global affairs or government's role in compliancy and where it begins and ends. But we have to, the purpose of the panel is trust, and trust is something, and having attended all these great panels for the last three days, is that everyone speaks about leadership with purpose, and that trust is the backbone of entrepreneurship. And trust is a um, something we take for granted, presumably, but what's actually refreshing is trust can, and especially my uh, industry, cannot be regulated. It doesn't, it can't be subjected to an algorithm. And I think that the next generation who masters social media have their own way of self-regulating because they understand how to um, put a company or a state to a higher standard just by social active uh, activism. The backlash is instant. And so we have to, a combination between ethics and trust, we have to regain the trust. Uh, there is no future with trust. And, um, I think maybe trust, you can't quantify it, but then I started thinking in the last two days, maybe it's cynical because uh, my industry is passion projects. That's what we does, passion, purpose. Uh, it's driven by that, but is trust then like salt? <laughs> like it used to be, is it like a currency? Uh, maybe if people were to trade it and put it in different contexts, because trust is context dependent, it's uh, relationship based. So if you enlarge the context in which you're going to explain it, 
I mean, you can't explain scientifically one, one artwork. Yes, there's, of course, data on some criteria and uh, databases on price record analysis and conditions, but you still cannot officially scientifically explain one, one artwork is more expensive than the other. It's subjective. So um, for trust, it seems to me that it eludes everyone. So maybe uh, if we were to quantify and value the like saying this is our exchange currency and this is what and have a common denominator for it, maybe we could uh, move forward because we um, there's many generations here uh, at Horasis, which is one of them. And so um, one of the things I took away yesterday from the panel was uh, adaptability. And the current generation of leaders, let's say after 45 and whatever, do not have the same flexibility and the to reaction time than the, ne uh, the newer generation coming in. And I think we have to look at that and be prepared to react quicker or to listen or to engage. And so perhaps therefore focusing on trust might be even more so putting it at the forefront of everything might help us do that. I just ask a question to you to any industry. <clears throat> I mean, if I talk it's all built on trust, but you had a lot of fraud cases as well. Mm -hmm. So how, how can you still have trust in, in the market? And when you have these cases, and you always have to, to be careful that you don't get cheated when you're buying something. Correct. Uh, but there is more regulation in place uh, on the basics so that it's not a fake. That has changed greatly. Uh, there used to be lots of court cases based on provenance. And I think in that sense, we're at the forefront of blockchain, because blockchain helps uh, uh, ingrain the provenance and that's half the value and that is prices. So in that sense we really are very effective and we are going and moving with our time, adapting and integrating technology in one of the most uh, uh, untransparent markets. Um, auction houses have come a long way, less collusion, but still it's an industry that what the appeal is, is uh, it's mystery to some extent. And it's an industry that, yes, there could be, uh, to some extent, we, it's been in existence for thousands of years. It's an industry that could be a little bit more transparency on uh, pricing, on uh, the parties, some provenance, but that's being dealt with, with blockchain, as I just said. But its very core of its appeal is exactly that, to some extent. It's lack of data, it's lack of transparency, it's people who you know or they're not. It's a, it's a game, whichever, and that's the very essence. Um, it doesn't answer fully, but uh, that is part of the, the journey. I mean, um, it's so to some extent, uh, when you look at the queues, for example, I, was, uh, I, think I live in London now, and you look at the queues of the v &A and you see this uh, constant queuing for all the blockbusters. And the blockbusters have replaced kind of uh, the scenes of the pilgrims, you know, searching the world for meaning, well, at least back to purpose. But that explains a little bit. Uh, you can't uh, quantify uh, that appeal, and sadly, that's when we need lawyers for every contract to try to mitigate that. Uh, but still, the raison d'être at the very core why people get involved in that space is unregulated. I hope that answers your question to some extent. Uh, I think that your point about that <coughs> well, you can't really explain why one piece of art is more expensive than others because it's a subjective thing. Uh, that's why we can't really regulate this or not even putting an algorithm on it. But I'm sure that will happen anyway. That will happen. Well, it's what? already, and I just want to compare it to humans. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why I think we're losing trust because humans, we are passionate as well. I mean, but we are trying to put us in categories and totally make us into computers. And, and that's why, why we're losing trust as well. Because we don't want it, it's against our nature. We want to be different. Um, so in that way, I totally agree with you. In an ideal world, we should not categorize everything and compare everything which is happening with AI and big data. And it shouldn't be done with art and it shouldn't be done with humans, but it is happening all over. Uh, I'd like to come here. Uh, we have been talking about about compliance, about regulation, about blockchain as a way of, means of bringing transparency. Uh, but this panel is about trust. 
and all these are the means to mitigate the lack of trust in society. But the core issue is how do we actually bring in and build the spirit of authentic trust? And uh, without uh, extrapolating it to the national context, so one of the, the areas where I work more is at the area of a startup or a small company. And um, I've been seeing that like, like a lot of companies, their, their whole basis of functioning was to keep checks and balances on employees to monitor what they do, what they, what they work. And uh, that kind of a old structure is actually based on a system where you don't trust your employees or you don't trust, uh, trust people in general. And that's why you need to have all these checks and balances to do that. And, uh, and uh, that's been part of my effort is how, because it's very hard to change mindsets because uh, in, in large companies, it's also uh, in a way, it's not just changing the, uh, the management, but also the employees who have been actually grown up in, a way, in an area where they've been always had checks and balance. Suddenly, if you remove those checks, maybe uh, because uh, uh, removing that means a lot of responsibility. From the uh, from the employee side, and that's where uh, I've been uh, uh, working with startups because I think that's where we, uh, the the young people have a different mindset, and they they want to build organizations which are based on autonomy, which are based on decentralization, which are based on concepts where you don't have a manager uh, controlling uh, things, and uh, and that's that's been a key challenge, and I think that's uh, an important issue that. Yeah. Discussed. That's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, but of course, even in, in, even when you have well-meaning employees, that doesn't ensure that nothing's going to go wrong, right? In, 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 actually, in many cases, well-meaning employees who think nothing can go wrong are the ones who, who make mistakes, right? It's not about going right or going wrong. It's about the intention and it's about the communication. Is the uh, are people in an organization authentic about what they feel? Do they have the freedom to express themselves? And do they feel, because things can always go wrong. Most of the startups fail. And uh, so if you're going to just say, okay, uh, if you're going to um, look at failure as if it's something bad, that is the basic reason why trust doesn't exist because people feel that if uh, if I'm going to be uh, take, uh, if I'm going to be punished for my mistakes, uh, obviously I'd rather put on a face and say uh, and 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 not be transparent. But uh, when we build a society or we build an organization where um, you feel that when you when you actually com authentically communicate. What are your feelings about a particular issue? What are your intentions about it? Uh, that's that's the basic foundation of building an organization where the employees uh, uh, and, and this has a big impact on the employee satisfaction itself and where the employees will go beyond uh, their regular duties in order to give more to the company. So it's more about the intention rather than the actual result. So have you um, seen your um, label uh, being used by uh, employees themselves as well to, to drive change? Or, or is that one of the intentions? Could that be one of the I, I think they, they actually... Uh, <laughs> okay, um, I, well, I actually, you know, on my organization, I'm going to start a startup actually, which just retired people, you know, just people that they are more than uh, 65 years old, you know, because I do believe that the knowledge is very, very important in these cases, you know, especially when you deal with human rights and other areas as well. So, um, I don't believe that judgment should be on youth or the age of a person to make a good company or a good startup, whatever. For me, the most important is exactly what it is and what the aim that we're looking for. Um, regarding to individuals, no, they really look on the company and to see, okay, I want to work on this company. Right now, the kids, they look at the company and say, what this company have done to the, to the climate change or, or what is the attitude that uh, this company has to social you know, behavior or you know, why they still keep doing you know, the, the, the shoes or whatever in, in countries where you still have child labor. So these are the matters that the kids that look at the company and say, I don't want to work on that company and I don't care if it pays more. So this is the judgment that the kids they do and even us. You know, so 
when we have something like that, that's the answer to have a good behavior, you know, and that it's like a self-regulator, if you could say. Yeah, because I was wondering, because it's sort of a mixture between um, complying with, you know, uh, voluntary rankings, essentially, and self-regulation in a way, yeah. right? Um, so, so this might really be a way forward in, in a way, right? Yes. Well, I think, you know, that, that would be wonderful if um, people could have the courage to move forward, to see the principles, and actually make that, you know, step. Okay, I want to go, I want to do, that's how I'm going to be happy. Doesn't matter the age, doesn't matter, you know, the thing is that you need to have the right attitude to the world, and that's the most important thing. So we have an audience. I have a question. Uh, Ara Bhutan, Sustainable Olympics Canada. So, uh, in order to formulate my question, let me start with two simple definitions. Whether you agree or not, so that will help perhaps us answer the question. So, trust is the ability to deliver on the promise, and a reputation is the history, perceived history of trust. So, what does the reputation of the global institutions? tell us about trusting them and therefore about their historical track record on delivering on their promise in the post-Second World War. War. Thank you. I'd like to address that. Well, maybe I've talked about global affairs. Uh, I, I, think, I think what you're asking is it has a lot to do with recent points on, on ethnic authenticity and, uh, and congruence you know, and and going back to kind of actual individual examples of, of um, a company or an individual you guys just brought it up you know, how does a, a business function how does it accrue trust and, and um, when I've set up my company I, I named it strategic narrative consulting because I feel that strategic narrative is that missing a bit if, if you take a uh, if you take a business, it usually has a mission and it's there as a profit-making enterprise. And it's, where will trust come from? Trust is, is not a, a logical thing, it's, it's the emotion, right? So if all you've got is, is a dull mission and then you're you know, making widgets and you're making money, it's, it's hard to accrue trust. But if you, within the company, you understand the narrative, you understand what your journey is, where you come from, where you're going, and then you act in accordance with that narrative, then you create that congruence, and then you create uh, awareness that you stand for something. You understand your journey, your you know your intermeaning within that entity, and then you act in accordance. Right? You, uh, I, I've had this framework for for a strategic narrative to have any sense. You need engagement with your stakeholders, and then act in concert with that in a way. Right? If you're if you're a business. You say we exist to uh, to achieve this objective. You know, be best at uh, making widgets. But then you explain what that really means. You know, what that, where you started, where you see yourself in, in so many years, who your stakeholders are, and then you talk to them. You explain your story, and then you quiz them together. And, and and maybe that applies to every institution. Uh, you know, has that proven that they know what they're doing? It's it's clear. They're it's not just a, a, again not a statement that no one has ever read a mission statement that's lost, but it's a story and narrative people relate to, and then that entity acts in accordance with it. That's interesting. So so are there any industries that have gone down this road um, more so than others? Explain where they make value, or we don't believe that. Then it's very difficult to to act in that sense. Uh, you can use the uh, news media business as an example of this, because when social media came out, you know everybody was democratized in the world because everybody had a chance to say something, right? And that's where we put our trust. In, if, if we talk in general, and news media forgot at least uh, in, uh, in in many European countries, I think, uh, forgot to tell why are they there? That they are regulated, they have some press ethics, and you know they they forgot to tell about their core existence. But that's what they're trying to do now when trust is going down, down for social media. I just want to say something about what you're saying, also about the global lack of global trust. I think it's so hard to talk about a trust in a global organization because we are so different. I mean, I usually talk about China as a data dictatorship, 
the US as a data monopoly, and Europe as trying to create, probably also Canada, a data democracy where we are in control of our own data. And how can you actually make talk about global trust when we have such different values in every uh, part of the world? So I think we should start. That's why I'm working mainly for European values. I know it sounds protectionistic, but I think that's the only way to go forward. I know we have international human rights, but I mean, who gives a shit about that in China, honestly? Uh, when we when we say that uh, trust has been declining, the way I see this whole global trend is actually uh, it's not a decline of trust, but it's a decline of blind faith. Because uh, for a long time, we have uh, as a society uh, not been able to question big pharma, not been able to question the insurance industry, not been able to question uh, governments and how they operate. And uh, clearly then things are getting more transparent. People can see it more clearly that, that there are uh, these big institutions which have not been, uh, which don't have the common good in mind. They, uh, they have been uh, doing all sorts of uh, uh, tricks to, to basically keep people sick for money. Or they, they, and, and, and basically this is a revolt from society that no, we, we want these institutions to break down because we want to build something new. Maybe we don't have a viable alternative yet. Uh, and, and I see it as very healthy uh, that this spirit of questioning in society, which may look like a breakdown of trust, but it's actually the beginning of questioning in society taking place. So, so how would you define trust then if you have this blind following you? Yeah, so, so when you bring in a transparent system and you have uh, institutions which don't have the common good of society uh, as part of their business model, uh, wh what's going to happen is that as they break down, new institutions are going to come up, which are going to be built on the principle which, uh, of, of common good, where uh, automatically it, it will invoke more trust. And uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, a lot of young people, they, they, they realize that the banking system has had, of course there is regulation, there is good point, but they want something else to come out of. There's this whole thing, whether it's, uh, whether it's blockchain or whether it's other experiments, those are very, very young experiments, uh, but they are, they are being done, in t even in terms of um, uh, banking sector, there are experiments being done with, where ethical banking and so on. Uh, so uh, at this stage, we, uh, uh, we are in the stage of experimenting alternative things. Even with medicine, people are moving towards more organic, more natural forms of therapies, so that, uh, because healthcare and medicine should not be so controlled and should not be so expensive, so, uh, so right now we are in the stage of, uh, of a rapid turmoil, but what's good is that once we build transparency based systems, the efficacy and effectiveness of different techniques should not be uh, uh, within the hands of a few regulators to say, yeah, you are regulated, you are you're not regulated, you are in, you are out. Uh, it, it needs to, uh, to, be, uh, to be a more uh, societal based where, where uh, more innovations can be given an opportunity and things that work and do not work uh, can eventually uh, be seen. It's very interesting and I guess one other example would be in the news media, right? Where you have a more subscriptions based uh, focus now where, where people um, directly, you, you're not dependent on advertisers so much anymore but you're dependent on the people who read you and judge you, basically, and the quality of your content, right? You, you are a former journalist, so what, what do you think? Uh, exactly the thing that news media now need to be much more transparent and tell about their mission and their ethics and everything they work for. Why are they there? What's their, the why? They've never done that. They took for granted that, that we knew, all the users knew that they were uh, working in that way. So it's totally changing the news business, but I don't think they'll get a new business model. Honestly, it's going to be really hard for them because everybody has their own, <laughs> own journalist today, right? So exactly. That's why you left journalism. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. And it's not just the news. Uh, uh, digital technologies have been bringing in. Uh, uh, they've been cutting out on the gatekeepers, 
So for instance, uh, let's take publishing industry. Now you, you, anyone can publish their book on Amazon uh, Kindle. Uh, well, uh, uh, well, that's that's for the society to judge. But but I I'm a big fan of the fact that anyone can publish a book and people can review it. And there are no gatekeepers deciding that oh this book is good should be published or this should not be published. Let the uh, audience, that's basically bringing in true spirit of democracy. Of course, I'm not vouching for Amazon as a company, that's something else. But, but the whole concept of you uh, re removing gatekeepers and allowing anyone to come in and, and letting the society decide. So our skeptic here on the panel, how does that sound to you? Um, I, I was just uh, thinking of something. A uh, question for me is how... Uh, how do we raise ethical levels uh, when uh, people, individuals, companies, as you were talking globally, have different uh, ideas of what's ethical and, and what's right? And for me, uh, in, in my business, we deal with, I deal with a lot of small businesses. And um, I see good and bad. And some uh, individuals and companies, they just, they will do things that I just, I can't believe, and they just, uh, it's, it's like nothing to them. So um, how, are we, how are we to raise the ethical uh, standards, you know, globally or in business if, if some people just, they just don't care? And, and also, um, I hear a, a lot of times uh, somebody will do something bad in business and they'll say, oh, it's, uh, it's not personal, it's just business. But I don't know what that means because all businesses are run by people. So. Um, other than, uh, I guess, shaming them or, 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 or something to, to make them uh, uh, raise ethical standards, I just, I'm, I'm wondering, I don't have an answer to this. Well, I think we can do it by showing the good examples, and that's uh, what I, the examples is not in this one, but it's, it's what are those companies working on, what's the basics, and that's, for example, human in the, at the center, everything you do, what is your pro data processing? Who is that gaining? Is it gaining your profits or efficiency, or is it gaining first and foremost humans? If you always have, if, it, if, if humans benefit from it, if you give them control over their own data and stuff like that, that's just the principles to gain, go there. And those companies working in that way, they will have much more trust. I actually do think that if we look at big companies like Apple, has a lot of trust when it comes to data. They're doing such a good job, and it's of course their target group are rich people <laughs> because it's so, they're so expensive, but they're really working very well with trust. Whereas Amazon is, I think, going totally down. Uh, I hope so also because, for example, when you publish stuff, they abuse their power. So if you want to publish a book at Amazon, if you put it at a price over ten dollars, you only get. 30% of your own turnover. If it's low $10, you get 30%, uh, 70%. So that's how they dictate prices. And that's how you also lose trust. I simply don't trust Amazon because they dictate that in that way. So we have to find new ways. Could we, we had some audience questions. Are they still relevant? Well, I didn't want to interrupt the discussion. Okay, yeah, was another on the subject. I, I just have one brief comment on, on, on what you brought up. Um, and we talked about privacy earlier on the panel, uh, individual privacy. But if we look at the trends, like let's take, I don't know, year 2050, do you think privacy is at all possible? Uh, especially for, for businesses? Not for businesses. No, not for the, the, the total transparency will be beyond belief, right? We already have all these digital footprints and, and records and, and things uh, that, that are knowable, which used to not be the case. Go one century back, you could not learn things about a particular business going back so many years unless you've done you know, months and months of research and talking to stakeholders and so on. But the future of, of transparency is conditioned by technology. So that behavior checks and, and the, the moral, you know, ethical standards and so on, it will be just the same way that, uh, that we click uh, rate the uh, you know, property on booking or, or uh, on Yelp or whatever. This, this kind of thing uh, will be somewhere much more pervasive and, and the transparency around behavior uh, will 
will become so commonplace that companies will c uh, compete on behavior. You, you will not compete on product or price, you will compete on how you do business. It will become a bigger factor, so it, it will, technology will self-correct, it will, it will create all other problems, but this one, the, the kind of ubiquitous transparency of everything and loss of privacy, We'll, we'll address it in some way. It's we'll very important to distinguish uh, transparency yeah. for companies and governments and privacy for humans. Yeah. And we need to keep privacy. To me, they blur. They blur. Yeah, but I, I shouldn't have like, said that. I, otherwise, we lose I know, humanity. But, uh, it's, it's, it's unfortunate to say that can I count on privacy going forward? I personally feel that that's, yeah, that's it's too much to trade off. Like I, I, I don't know. I, I hope we keep it, but, but realistically speaking, I don't think that's going to be the case. But uh, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm too realistic or too pessimistic. But, uh, yeah. but the issue is just it's all about uh, reputation. It will be judged on reputation. Yeah. And the more you
Uh, Finnish, Swedish, or Swedish. So or Nokia and everything. Yes, and, but that's, and, and that's what I'm saying. And why I say this because we actually have a better regulatory framework in Europe than they have in, in China or in the US. I trust the regulatory framework more in Europe, and that's why I would always try and choose European before I choose American or US. Interesting thought. Um, and last question, I think. We have two minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm, the, I'm the voice of the group because I was born in the Soviet Union, so by definition, mistrust in institutions is something that we grew up with. And my question, I, I, I want to, uh, to re reiterate on my question. What does the reputation of uh, supranational institutions in the post-World War world tell us? You see, we're focusing in Latin on the companies, but you see, when the company loses its reputation, then it's reflected in, 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 in its profits, right? When an institution, when a public institution loses its reputation, or an institution led by an elected politician, they usually have time to restore that reputation before the next election. That also uh, leads me to think about the congruence of the narrative, right? You remember there was a fantastic British sitcom, Yes, Minister, and there's a phrase from there, I don't need the truth, I need something I can tell the parliament. <laughs> and this is what scares me even today, we're focusing on the companies, but what does the reputation of the supranational institutions in Europe, in Asia, in North America, tell us, in Canada we're having a case with our prime minister appearing not to be very congruent when, uh, when he talks about, uh, you know, gender parity and indigenous people and fires the attorney general for well, whatever reason. So you know the story, I don't want to get into the details. So this is what scares me today. So we're looking at the companies rightly. There is another huge stakeholder in this story. And it's kind of, you know, hiding in the shadows. Thank you. Yeah. So quick point on it. Yeah. So uh, I do think that politicians manage to gain trust in five years. It's simply because the political system is broken and it's not really a free market economy. So if you imagine the case uh, we, we had a few years ago uh, when we didn't have enough competition, you have one or two companies and they are monopolistic. It's the same case with, uh, with democracies all over the world. It's, it's not, you never have the majority of the people voting for the winning uh, candidate. In, in very, very few countries it happens. So obviously we are looking, uh, it calls for uh, a political reform and probably uh, that's a bigger debate. But uh, if we did have a complete free, uh, a free market in terms of the politics, uh, these politicians would not be elected again. Well, thanks so much and I guess, you know, um, that shows just how broad and uh, multifaceted um, <laughs> the issue really is. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, we need a few more hours to discuss all of this. But thanks so much um, for, for coming here. And, uh, and I'm sure there's uh, room for discussion. <laughs>